In this video, we'll take a look at the common functional groups that you have to know in your organic chemistry course. So what is a functional group? In organic chemistry, you see a lot of molecules that are made up of carbons and hydrogens. You can get many complex structures and many isomers from just carbons and hydrogens, but for a molecule to be reactive, it tends to have other atoms with different electronegativities, different electron concentrations, pi bonds. Those specific groups, those are your functional groups. Now before we go into functional groups, I want to talk about one type of group that you'll see that's not a functional group at all, and that's the R group. As you're looking through your textbook, you'll see molecules that have carbons, oxygens, nitrogens, and an R group. But an R group does not represent a specific collection of atoms. Instead, the R group tells you what you have on the rest of the molecule. For example, if I'm looking at this structure here, but then I have some complex group, a C, double bound O, single bound O, single bound to another C with three hydrogens, and I specifically want to focus on this portion of the molecule, I don't want to look at the carbon chain. It's not my priority for this discussion. So instead of rewriting this entire molecule and the group that I boxed off, I'll turn the entire purple portion into R for the rest of the molecule, and then simply focus on the ester here, which is a CO2CH3. R is the rest of the molecule that I don't want to focus on right now, but I still acknowledge that it's there. When talking about functional groups, you'll typically see R dash functional group to show that it can come up on any type of molecule. Another thing to discuss before we go into functional groups are the type of carbon chains that you're going to see, specifically the alkane, alkene, and alkyne. Notice the ending alkane is A-N-E, -E. alkene is E-N-E, -E. alkyne is Y-N-E. -E. And this tells you the number of pi bonds, specifically carbon to carbon pi bonds that you're going to see. An alkane has no pi bonds between carbon atoms. That means every carbon is single bound to another carbon. You'll see this drawn out in line structure as a zigzag where every carbon is sp3 hybridized with an ideal bond angle of 109.5 degrees. An alkene is a molecule that has at least one double bond between carbon atoms. You'll see that as carbon double bound to carbon, where the first bond is a sigma, and that's with your hybridized orbitals, and the second is a pi bond sitting in the p orbitals. In line structure, it'll look the same as your alkane, except that you'll see a second line representing the pi bond. You can have more than one double bond on a molecule as long as they're different carbon atoms that have the pi bond so that each is still considered a double bond. The carbons holding the double bond are sp2 hybridized with a bond angle of 120 degrees. And finally we have the alkyne which is a triple bond between two carbon atoms. Notice here we have two double bonds because each individually has a double bond, but with an alkyne you'll see three lines between two carbon atoms. The first is a sigma, and that's on your sp hybridized carbon. The second and third are your pi bonds sitting in p orbitals, one in the py and one in the pz. Many professors will try to represent a triple bond the same way as a double and a single in terms of the zigzag, but this is incorrect and I don't like it. And that's because a triple bond is sp hybridized with a bond angle of 180 degrees, and so the correct way to represent it would be something like this. You want to have a linear line where the triple bond sits between the two carbon atoms. That would be these two right here. But the two carbon atoms or other atoms on either direction of the triple bond are also in a straight line because of that 180 degree bond angle. Now that you understand it, let's memorize it. I have them memorized as 1, 2, 3, ain, ein, ein. Ain is 1, single bond. Ein is 2, double bond. Ein is 3, triple bond. The first and simplest functional group we'll look at is the alkyl halide or the haloalkane. Recall from general chemistry that group 7 on the periodic table are your halogens or your halides, that's where we get the alkyl halide, and these are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine in that order going down the group. 
If you have a carbon chain with any halogen attached to it, that is considered an alkyl halide or a haloalkane, and you just insert the name of the halogen to be more specific. So for example, if I put a chlorine on the primary carbon here, I will get a primary alkyl chloride or chloroalkane or simply a primary alkyl halide. If I place iodine on a secondary carbon, I get a secondary alkyl halide. If you're not comfortable identifying your primary, secondary, and tertiary carbons, make sure you study my pencil trick tutorial linked in the description below. And if I place a fluorine on a tertiary carbon, I get a tertiary halogen or a tertiary alkyl halide. These are very important to understand and recognize because they will play a big role in the reactions moving forward, especially substitution and elimination reactions. The next functional group I want to look at are the amines, which have N in the word where N stands for the nitrogen atom. An amine is a molecule that has nitrogen bound to carbon, and this could be bound to a one, two, three, or four carbons to give you a different type of amine. To show you the different types of amines, we'll use R to represent the rest of the molecule. If I have R bound to an NH2, remember nitrogen can have three bonds, this is considered a primary amine because it's bound to one R group. If I have R bound to nitrogen, which is bound to a second R, which we'll show as R prime, this is considered a secondary amine because nitrogen is bound to two R groups. If I have a nitrogen bound to three R groups, that's R, R prime, and R double prime, that's a tertiary amine, and these are the common ones you're going to see. But every now and then you'll see a nitrogen bound to four R groups. That'll be bound to R, R prime, R double prime, and R triple prime. If you do a quick formal charge, you'll recognize that the quaternary amine has a positive charge because nitrogen prefers to have three bonds and one lone pairs. But if and when it comes up, recognize that yes, a quaternary amine does exist. And the key to recognizing the amine functional group Amine, spelled with an N, has the key atom, nitrogen. Many of the remaining functional groups will have oxygen in them, and the key is to recognize the difference between how oxygen is attached to the parent chain. The alcohol has COH in the name, where C can be part of your R group. So if you have your R group, and attached to that you have a C, an O, and an H, that's an alcohol where the alcohol is the OH or hydroxy group. Hydroxy comes from the word hydrogen and oxygen. So if you see a carbon chain with an OH on the primary carbon, that's a primary alcohol. If the OH was on the tertiary carbon, that would be a tertiary alcohol. A similar functional group is the thiol, which you'll notice sounds like alcohol. It ends in OL, which is how you identify an alcohol but the thigh portion of the molecule represents the sulfur atom. So if we take a molecule and draw an alcohol, but now we erase the oxygen and replace it with the sulfur, this is a sulfur alcohol or simply a thiol. Recall that sulfur sits under oxygen on the periodic table, so they have very similar binding ability. The next group I want to look at is the ether, and this is one of the first confusing functional groups. An ether is represented by R, O, R, where you have an oxygen sitting in between two carbon groups. You can have a symmetrical ether. For example, if I have CH3O, CH3, this is dimethyl ether because I have two methyls surrounding that oxygen. You can also have an asymmetrical ether. For example, if I have a CH3 bound to an O, the second R group is a CH2, CH3, or an ethyl group. This is ethyl methyl ether, where the two R groups are different, and in this case we'd have to write it as RO, R prime. A good trick to remember the ether is to think of the word ether. It looks like we have R, O, R. We have either R or something else. Ether or. Ether has O, R in the word. Do not confuse the ether with an ester, which we'll look at shortly. Ethers can exist as a linear chain like we see here, or you can see a cyclic ether. For example, if I show you a five-membered ring where we have 
four carbon atoms and one oxygen. This is still an ether, it's a cyclic ether, it's one that you'll have to know later in your organic chemistry reactions. This is tetrahydrofuran, or THF, which comes up a lot in reactions. You don't have to memorize the names of cyclic ethers except for this one, the epoxide. Epoxides are very reactive and will come up a lot in organic chemistry, so I want you to recognize the epoxide is a three-membered ether, where you have a three-atom ring, two carbons, and one oxygen. And you can have R groups or hydrogens coming off of it, but the key is this small triangle made up of two carbons and one oxygen, giving you an epoxide. The next set of functional groups we'll look at all have the carbonyl in common, where carbonyl is C double bound O. This will be very important later on because the carbonyl has resonance, and that means you get a partial positive on carbon and a partial negative on oxygen. But for now, we'll focus just on the structure. And since there's a pi bond between them, both the carbon and oxygen are sp2 hybridized with a bond angle of 120 degrees. When you have the carbonyl in the middle of the chain, meaning the carbonyl has R groups on either side, you get a ketone. The way I remember this is ketone ends in O-N-E. A ketone does not want to be alone. Own. It doesn't want to be alone, and therefore it's surrounded by R groups on either side. If I wrote this out showing the atoms, we would see CH3 bound to the carbonyl, bound to the CH3, because it's in the middle. It doesn't want to be alone. Just like the ether, the ketone can be symmetrical. In this case, we have two methyl groups. Or it can be asymmetrical if I replace the methyl group on the right with an ethyl group. This is also a ketone. If you see this written out, you'll see it as R carbonyl and R or R prime, depending on if the second R group is the same or different. Or if the pi bonds are not being shown, this is R, C, O, R. Don't mix this up with the ether, which was just R, O, R. Because we have the carbon there, it's not an oxygen in the chain. Instead, it's a carbon in the chain, double bound to an oxygen atom. Aldehydes are very similar to ketones, so don't confuse the two. The aldehyde also has a functional group on a carbon chain. But in the aldehyde's case, it's not in the middle of the molecule, like the ketone that doesn't want to be alone. Instead, the carbonyl is at the end of the molecule, so that the last atom here is a hydrogen. The aldehyde has an H in the word to remind you that there is a hydrogen at the end rather than another carbon or another R group. If we write this out, we have CH3, CH3, CH2 for the propyl group, then we'll have C double bound O for the carbonyl and H for the aldehyde. If you want to write this out in simple terms, it'll be R carbonyl H instead of R carbonyl R prime like the ketone. Or we can write it out even simpler, R C H O. This is another source of confusion for students. I want to make sure you understand. R C H O has the carbon, then the hydrogen, then the oxygen, telling you that it's carbon, then bound to hydrogen, the hydrogen sits on the carbon, and then the oxygen has to come back and be written on the carbon. Don't confuse this with the alcohol, which we showed as RCOH. If it's O then H, it's an alcohol, because you have a carbon followed by hydroxy, OH, but an aldehyde is not hydroxy, it's HO, giving you a completely different functional group and a completely different molecule. The next functional group I want to look at is a carboxylic acid, and this is another source of confusion for students, so make sure you understand. The carboxylic acid has a carbon chain with a carbonyl at the end, C double bound to O, and then attached to that, we have an OH. Students will look at this and think, oh, I have a carbonyl and an alcohol, but that is not the case. Whenever you see a carbonyl directly attached to an OH, that is not an alcohol attached to an aldehyde. That is a brand new functional group, the carboxylic acid. If we write this out, we'll have CH3, CH2 for the ethyl portion, then the carbonyl and OH. If we want to write this out even more simply, we can have R 
to represent the ethyl group or the rest of the molecule, COOH, you'll also see it as RCO2H. We're showing that there are two oxygens in this functional group. One oxygen sitting on the carbon in a double bond, the second oxygen sitting on the side as an OH. As you'll see late in organic chemistry too, carboxylic acids can be reacted so that the OH is swapped for another group, and those are your carboxylic acid derivatives, giving you a whole new set of functional groups. The first one we'll look at is what happens when we take that OH on the carboxylic acid and replace it with an OR. This molecule is called an ester. For example, if we swap this R group for a CH3, we'll have CH3, CH2, C double bound O, single bound O, single bound CH3 for a methyl ester because it's a methyl sitting on the longer parent chain. If you want to write this out the short way, the ester is RCO2R prime. Just like a carboxylic acid, RCO2 or RCOO, but instead of a hydrogen at the end, you have an R group at the end. Esters are often confused with ethers, so I want to make sure you see them together and understand the difference. If we have an ester that's RCO2R prime, and ether is just RO-R prime. Remember for ethers we said it's either or, that's it. It's R and OR, nothing else, either R or the OR. An ester has an S. Think of that S as standing for your second R group. Because ester looks like a carboxylic acid, but it has a second R group. And in the example we saw above, that second R group was a methyl. One more time, we have our carboxylic acid, but this time I'm going to replace that OH with a nitrogen. So for example, if I replace it with an NH2, I get a new functional group, and this one is the amide. Amide sounds very much like amine, but remember the amine, we said N for nitrogen, where nitrogen was the primary focus of the functional group because we had just nitrogen and carbon, R groups, nothing else. The amide looks like a carboxylic acid and sounds like amine. Well, it looks like a carboxylic acid because it's a carboxylic acid derivative, and it sounds like amine because we have a nitrogen in there, and the D is to remind you that in addition to the amine portion, we also have a double bond carbon to oxygen. D for double bond carbon to oxygen on a molecule that sounds like amine. Just like amines, when it comes to amides, it doesn't have to be just an NH2. We can have NH2, a simple amide, or we can add some R groups in there. For example, I can put a CH3 with one hydrogen, or two CH3s, or any R group, I just chose methyl, with no hydrogen, because nitrogen, remember, likes three bonds and one lone pair. These are different types of molecules that you have to recognize as an amide. It sounds like amine, it looks like an amine, but the D reminds you there's also a double bond carbon to oxygen in that same functional group. There's another nitrogen containing functional group that has R and then C triple bound N. This right here is called a nitrile. It's also referred to as a cyano group because CN minus is cyanide, comes from cyanic acid. This will come up in your organic chemistry reactions, so make sure that you do recognize it. The nitrile has a C triple bound to N on the carbon chain. The last group we'll look at is not really a functional group, but it comes up so often, and students mix it up so often, so I want to make sure that you're clear on the difference. Phenol versus phenol. A phenol and a phenol, they kind of sound similar, but a phenol ends in OL, which tells you that it's an alcohol, right? Alcohol also ends in OL, and phenol ends in YL. In naming organic compounds, when you have an R group as a substituent, it ends in YL. For example, a CH3 is a methyl, a CH3, CH2 is an ethyl, YL. The beginning of the word, the phen portion, should hint benzene ring, and it's simply a question of what the benzene ring looks like. 
The phenol is a benzene ring alcohol. That means we have a benzene ring, a six carbon chain with alternating pi bonds, and an OH attached to it. That's it. It's not attached to a bigger chain. It doesn't have anything else coming off it. Phenol, phenyl alcohol. But when you have just phenyl, that is the benzene ring as a substituent on a larger chain. So we'll show instead of an alcohol, an R group attached to it. So if you have a giant molecule with a benzene substituent, that substituent is a phenyl, YL substituent, not to be confused with a phenol, which is a benzene ring alcohol. I hope this video helps you not only understand what to look for in functional groups, but also gives you a couple of tricks to help you memorize them. First thing I want you to do, give this video a thumbs up and leave a comment below letting me know if it helped you and which mnemonic you liked best. Then make sure you visit my website layerforsci.com naming so that you can download my free full color functional group cheat sheet as well as try the practice quiz. And then start working through the naming series, showing you how to tackle each functional group, including IUPAC and common names. The link again is leaforsci.com slash naming.